How are you guys doing this morning? Uh, if we've never met, my name's TJ, pastor here at the Shore Church, and I am so very excited that you guys are here this morning. Uh, before I jump into this series, Thrill Sequence, before we continue that, I do want to remind you that tonight is our... Uh, our, our, our party on the shore, and Jared will give you more details about that later. It's going to be a great night, but in, in the middle of our party of the shore, there's also baptisms, and if, and if you're getting, if you have never been baptized, man, today is your day. You're, it's time, okay? And, and if you want to get baptized or you are getting baptized, meet me after this service. We're just going to meet right over here. I've got some shirts for you. I'm going to tell you when to show up. I'm going to answer your questions about baptism and explain it a little more for you if you do have questions. And if that's you, just go ahead and meet me right back over here. And we'll be ready for you, okay? You guys ready for that? Okay, you guys are the exciting service, aren't you? Okay, you're the ones that are awake. You're the morning people. I like this. Or you just have kids that got you up anyway, right? Welcome to my life. Okay, so here we are. We are in week number two of this series called Thrill Sequence. And Thrill Sequence, if you weren't here last week, you may be going, what is it? What is a thrill sequence? Well, a thrill sequence is a sequence that is thrilling. That's pretty, pretty awesome, right? And, and it's, it's this sequence that we chase. It, it's really, we chase a thrill after a thrill after a thrill. And oftentimes in our lives, we, we get caught up in the thrills of life, but we never actually move forward. So last week, I gave you the illustration of a roller coaster. Well, what happens on a roller coaster, right? You climb in, you strap in, you chase a thrill, right? You're flipping and spinning and twisting, and you're going fast, and you're going slow. And then what happens at the end of it all? You end up right where you started, Right? And that's so many of the thrills we've chased in our life, where we get on and we flip and we, and we, and we have an experience, but we never actually move forward in our life, do we? It's, it's a chasing mentality. We, we constantly have to get the next thrill or the bigger thrill with whatever's happening in our life. And, and, and quite often, we all chase something. We, you may not be the thrill seeker. You may not be the rock climber or the, the bungee jumper or the... the, the the paraglider, whatever you want to be, base jumper, anything. You, you may not be that kind of person, but we all are chasing some sort of thrill in our lives. We all chase, uh, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's money, maybe it's possessions, uh, maybe it's power or influence or a career, whatever the case may be. We chase and we chase and we chase, but how many times has that chase let you down, right? Leaving you right where you started. Well, today we want to take, get off the thrill sequence, and we want to chase something real in our lives. And we have this incredible example of a guy named Solomon in the Old Testament. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. And so we're going to read a couple verses from Ecclesiastes to kind of get us up to speed with this thrill sequence. Look what uh, uh, Solomon says. He says this, anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all of my labors. And then he continues, anything I wanted, I took, right? But then he goes, but as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless. You ever come to that point in your life where you look around and you go, man, I've done this and this and this and this, and it's like, but I still don't feel satisfied? That's where Solomon was. He goes, I, I, it's, 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 it was so meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. And so he chases the thrill. He chases the thrill. He chases the thrill. And like B.B. King said, the thrill is gone, right? The thrill is gone away, right? Like, it just, it just, it just did not work anymore. No B.B. King fans in the house. I get it. Okay, all right. I got one or two. Okay, you're not, maybe we're just not old enough to appreciate it. Maybe that's it. Oh, <laughs> Mm, that was a low blow, TJ. I'm sorry. Okay, but, but, but here's, here he is, thrill after thrill after thrill, and he goes, it didn't really work for me. You, and and, and I, I didn't cover this last week. I want to show you something in this verse. I can kind of tell you why the thrill didn't work. R right in the language that he uses, he indicates why it didn't work. Let's go back to that verse again, and I want you to notice how many times he says I or my in this verse, okay? Check this out. Anything I wanted. I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in the hard work reward for all my labors. And he continues, but as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless. Is there a theme there? The thrill is all about you. Have you ever heard the person wrapped up in their selves is a pretty small package? When we chase the thrill, it really is all about us. But when we, when we are trying to find satisfaction in and of ourselves without an intervention from God or anyone else, we will never be fully satisfied. 
We will never really find something real and genuine in our life if it's all about us. And Solomon discovered that, and it took him a lot of time, took him a lot of effort, took him, took him a lot of expense to get there. But eventually he discovered, wait a minute, I can't be all about me. And so in contrast to that, you've got to think, well, what's the opposite of being self-centered? It's to be other-centered, right? And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we all just need to think of everyone else first and our, our life will be 100% better because I don't think you can do that. Can you do that? Stop thinking about yourself? <laughs> Eventually, as we mature and grow, I think we will think about others more and ourselves less. But I'm not going to stand here today and tell you everyone in the room needs to think about everyone else first because it's, it's a journey that we need to go on. Is that our end goal? Sure, that, that's a great goal to have. But today, I don't want you, to, I don't think we're going to be able to take that step of maturity from chasing the thrill to chasing everything else for other, everyone else over the, in, in an instant, in a message. 30 minutes is not going to do it, right? I've been trying to do it my whole life so far, and I'm not there yet. So what's the next step? We, we don't need to find the end. We need to know the end, but we need to take another step. So what's the next step in this journey going from self-serving thrill-seeking what do we need to do first? What's the first thing we need to do? Well, I'm going to hold out to you today that today, once we become a believer and we follow God, the next step is to do what he says, <laughs> is to have a little self-discipline or even godly discipline in our lives and really begin to pursue what he has for us. Check this out from Hebrews chapter 12. I love this verse in the message translation. It says this, uh, at the time, discipline isn't much fun. Who would agree? Right? Like at the time, when, when I was a kid, my parents disciplined me. I was like, this is not much fun at all, right? When, when, when I get into a situation where I feel like I've done something stupid, I'm reaping the consequences, the disciplines of my stupid decision, I'm going, this is not fun, right? And it's, it always feels like it's going against the grain, always swimming upstream. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely. Later, discipline pays off handsomely, for it is the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. Our goal today is to get one step closer to a mature relationship with God. So how are we going to do that? Well, <laughs> we've got to be uh, well-trained. We've got to be self-disciplined. We, we have to begin to pursue what God has for us. And, and maybe self-discipline is a bad word to use. M maybe we could just call it discipline or simply a discipline to be obedient to what God has called us to, to a real life that he's inviting us into, to follow him with our entire life. So, so the difference between this self-serving and this self-discipline are, are pretty vast. And, and, and as I'm thinking about it, um, this line in here, it always feels like it's going against the grain. As, as soon as I read that, it reminded me of when I was a kid, probably middle school. Uh, my dad taught me how to sharpen a knife because we, we did things outside, outdoorsman kind of stuff, fishing and whatever else. And so he was teaching me how to take a, a stone and, and, and sharpen a knife. Have you ever done that before? right? <laughs> a couple people are like, never in my life. You just, <laughs> not, not one time ever. Never even thought I'd try, you know? But, but the, here I am, a middle schooler, and, 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 the, and the idea of rubbing a knife on a rock to make it sharper was like beyond my comprehension, right? Like, just like, you're like, this, this makes it, I thought this would make it a lot duller, just rubbing it on a rock, you know, or a stone. It, it doesn't matter if it was a special stone or magic stone. I thought this is not going to work at all, right? But, but my dad taught me that when you get the right angle and you kind of go against the grain of the stone, you begin to take off the dull edge of that knife and it begins to leave behind a sharp edge. And, and you get to find the, the goal is to have a sharper knife, right? And so as that happens, the resistance is actually what brings about the change that you want to see in your knife. And I think the same is true with our lives, right? Like When we start to resist the selfish tendencies of the thrill sequence or the self-serving attitudes and go, okay, God, what do you have for my life? That same resistance that's kind of like, ooh, that's a, that's a hard thing to do. When we do that, it's actually going to bring about the results that we always wanted in our life. You follow me on that? I was sharing this in our staff meeting with some of our guys, and, and we have some interns at the church this year, and, and I'm going, and I'm talking about sharpening a knife, and they're the ones going, what? Like, I've never tried to sharpen a knife, and, and, and I'm talking about the, the kind of the laborious process of sharpening a knife, and one of the guys goes, why would you sharpen it when you could just buy a new one, right? <laughs> Like, but I'm like, that's the problem, right? Isn't that our problem? Like, how many times do we go, um, I'd rather just buy something instead of go through the discipline of, of, of getting better at it, that, or, or making it the process better? Let me, let me give you a couple examples. Instead of self-serving, just buy a new one. Uh, we, we need to 
we need to get uh, self-disciplined, sharpen the knife, okay? And, and so there's, there's a lot of different examples. Okay, I could, I could do, what if you don't like to cook, right? You, you could be undisciplined and just like, <laughs> hello, Domino's, like every single day, right? You never have to cook again. And for some teenagers, they're like, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that, right? <laughs> but, but for those of us who have grown up a little bit and our waistline has expanded a little more, we, we understand that if you go through the discipline of shopping for groceries and you, and you go through the discipline of learning how to cook, there's, it actually tastes better than Domino's, right? <laughs> and I know it's hard to believe, uh, you know, but, but it actually does. And it's healthier for you. And as you invest the time, instead of instant gratification of, hello, can I have pizza now? Sure, you know, 30 minutes or less. What if we went through the process, the, the delayed satisfaction of learning the process? That, that's a pretty simple example, but you follow me, right? Right? The same is true with our financial goals. When, when God has called us to, to, to live a certain lifestyle, instead of going out and saying, instant gratification, I'll just put it on credit. I'll just sign the loan. I'll just do whatever, and then I get what I want right now, and I pay for it later, right? What if we, oh, this, is a, this is a revolutionary idea, okay? What if we just saved our money until we could buy it? Like, think about that. It's not instant gratification, but it's delayed satisfaction. I'm telling you, whatever you buy when you save up for it is going to be so much sweeter to you than if you just got it right away. The same is true in so many areas of our life. The one that nobody likes to talk about, in fact, <laughs> I don't even like talking about, is pornography. It's really quiet in here. I just got to tell you right now. <laughs> talk about instant satisfaction, right? I I instant gratification. It's so much different. A couple clicks and you're there. But what about delayed satisfaction? I can only speak from a male perspective because uh, I am one. Uh, and so... <laughs> But, but honestly, like, like what, the process of, of, of finding a woman <laughs> that likes you back and you woo her heart and you, and, and you go through the process of a asking dad, hey, can I marry her, right? And you get married and then for year after year and decade after decade, you, you make it your goal in life to win her heart day after day, month after month. That is a long process, right? But it is so much better than click, click, click. You follow me? It is so much better. It's a delayed satisfaction, but it's always sweeter when you do it that way. Instant gratification is not good for you in most cases. It just, it, it, it feeds something temporarily. It's a thrill sequence, but what we want to do is find the disciplines so that we can reach that maturity in our relationship with God. Now, you may be going, okay, TJ, what does it look like, though? Because you talk, keep talking about we're going to have something better, something real, something tangible. What does that look like? Why, why, how do I know when I get there? I'm glad you asked, okay? I've got three points for you this morning, and I'm going to move through them relatively quickly, uh, but I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to pick up each one, and the first one is this. The first one is purpose. Purpose. When we surrender our lives to God, and we begin to let him lead us, and we pursue the, the, the disciplines that he's called us to, you're going to find purpose. And purpose is powerful. Purpose is what gets you out of bed in the morning. It, it makes you feel like you're actually living, not just a cheap thrill, but, but day after day, routine after routine, you still get to come alive in all of it. It is purpose. Purpose is when you lay your head down at night, and you think to you, I get to live this life. I don't have to endure this life. I don't have to uh, endure my job or whatever. I get to do these things. Not I have to, but I get to. That's what purpose does in our lives. And that's what Jesus is calling each and every one of us to. If you check out Matthew chapter 4, Jesus puts a purpose calling on some of his early disciples. One day, as Jesus was walking, walking along the shore, <laughs> that's a good name for a church right there, uh, walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon also called Peter, and Andrew throwing a net into the water for they fished for a living. They had a job. They had a career. They were small business owners, right? They, they, they had a life put together. But look at this. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. He's saying, you have a life, but I'm going to give you a purpose. He's inviting them into something deeper. For them, it meant changing their vocation. For many of us, it doesn't mean changing our vocation but it means changing our focus, changing the way we look at our vocation, the purposes of why we are in this workplace or in this family or in this position. For them, it meant a change in everything, and they left their nets at once and followed him. That, that verse always astounded me. They left their nets at once and followed him. 
Now, now the truth of the matter is they had met Jesus a time before, so they already had a recognition of who Jesus was. But still, even, even if I've known you my entire life and you were like, hey, yeah, let's do something completely different, come follow me, I'd kind of be like, mm, let me see if I can get my affairs in order and see if I can make it happen, right? But they're just going, okay, I'm done, I'm ready. Why? Because he invited them into a purpose. He invited them into something bigger than themselves. He invited them into something more than just making a living and then selling their fish or whatever else. He invited them into something so much more than that. He invited them into purpose. And I think that's the calling that God has for each and every one of us. It doesn't matter where you are, whether you, uh, you take care of uh, your family or you work in a workplace, whether you're retired or you're in school, whatever the case may be, there is a purpose for you being there. And God has a purpose for your life pursue that purpose. And if you don't know what it is, I'm here to help you, all right? That's why we've designed our growth track classes. Did you know that? that it, the whole purpose of growth track is to design for you to help begin to discover. By the end of growth track, will you know, oh, I'm supposed to do this for the rest of my life? No, I can almost guarantee that you won't. But you will get a head start. You will begin the process of growing and understanding. So today at 5 o'clock at our 3.0, we're going to give you a spiritual gifts test a personality profile, and a passion assessment. We're going to help you take those three things and begin to see wh how you were uniquely made so that God could use you. And, and by the way, <laughs> I give you dinner and child care for the thing too. So it's like a date. You just got to listen to us for an hour, okay? It's pretty easy. It's pretty simple. So with that, if you want, if you've been struggling with purpose, if you've been struggling with your why am I here question, what is God calling me to do? Come tonight. Just mark it on your card. We'll be ready for you. Got it? Deal? Deal. Okay. Number two, power. Power. If you're noticing a trend here, there is two P words, okay? Point number three, I guess you can, <laughs> you can guess. That's probably a P word too, right? But it's, so it's memorable, right? We, we, we want to have purpose in our life, but without power, purpose is kind of meaningless. Without the ability to actually accomplish these things, we, we don't have it. We need, we need power from God in our lives. So when we begin to chase the real and we begin to discover the real in our life, we're also going to discover that God is going to use us and he's, his spirit is going to work through us. It's the power of God at work within us. So I'm going to read you a, a series of verses and then, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. Matthew chapter 21 says this, you can pray for anything and if you have faith, you will receive it. Luke chapter 10, look, I'm giving you authority over the power of the enemy. You can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them, and nothing will injure you. John chapter 15, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. John chapter 14, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. This is Jesus talking, and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father, James chapter 5 says this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. I read these verses and go, oh my gosh, that's the life that I want to live. How about you? I, I want to I live that way. I want to walk into life going, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to be scared or the victim in every situation. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk with power because God is with me. He has called me with a purpose. I'm not afraid of what could be because I know that God already is. You follow me? I want that kind of power in my life. And then number three, number three is position. Position. We need purpose. We need power. But as you begin to grow in your relationship with God, mature in Christ, your position begins to change. Your position. I'm not talking about like a work position or anything like that. But your position on certain issues, like, like your perspective on life begins to change. This is what John Newton said about that position. He says, when people are right with God, they are apt to be hard on themselves and easy on other people. You ever met someone like that? They're just so gracious. They're so loving. They're so kind. <laughs> But when people are not right with God, they are easy on themselves and hard on others. You ever meet someone like that? Right? Like they, they're, they're kind of that hypocrisy kind of going on. They, you, you can see that their life is not together, but they're the first ones to call out someone else. Judgmental people. You guys are very quiet. Are you those people? Like what's going on? Like <laughs> you're like trying not to move. Is, I'm si am I sitting next to them right now? You know, like whatever. But, but the case, the, here, here's, the, here's the deal. When, as we mature in Christ, our position begins to change. We, we, we go from that person who is a little bit harder on others than we need to be and easy on ourselves to really finding that discipline in God and really pushing ourselves to grow in Him 
and we're easier on others because we understand the nature of growth. And we know that it's harder, it's positioning. And you may not know who John Newton is, but his story is so powerful. Uh, you probably know something that John Newton wrote. He was a hymnist. He was, he was writing these hymns, these songs. And he's the one that wrote the song that eventually became known as Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And through that song, you see his positioning starting to change, right? I once was lost, but now I'm found. There's a position change. I, I, I was blind. I couldn't see the reality of God, but now I see his position begins to shift. And, and throughout John Newton's life, we see his position change throughout life. Now, when he first became a Christian, his position changed minimally. He, he still had issues. In fact, John Newton was a sailor. You ever hear the phrase, curse like a sailor? That was John Newton. He was the worst kind of sailor. He was in the slave trade industry, and, and he took ships of slaves to wherever they needed to go to be bought and sold. So he wasn't exactly like the most upstanding citizen, right? One day there was a storm, and his, sh- and his ship was about to, to, to go down, and uh, there was a, uh, something had like broken the side of the hull, and he began to cry out to God. He says, God, I don't know if you're real, but if you are, help me, right? <laughs> you ever pray a prayer like that? Help. And all at once, the ship tossed, and a car- the cargo went and filled the hole, and they made it safely to land right in that same moment. And he goes, dude, deal. God, I'm yours, right? And he got out of sailing, but he didn't change immediately. You see, his life, he wa- used to be a slave trader, but then once he became a Christian, he got off the boats, but he still kept investing in slave trade financially. Th- he didn't shift right away. His position changed minimally. But over the course of his life, as he began to mature and discover God, and he began to understand the disciplines of God, his position on the whole thing started to change. He went to seminary. He became a pastor. He began to write beautiful hymns uh, uh, to teach people about God. And eventually, by the end of his life, uh, he was one of the leaders in the abolitionist movement uh, to end slavery in his country of England, where he was from. And at the end of his life, in 1807, he actually got to see uh, the complete uh, end to the slave trade in his nation. Talk about going from one position to another. But you know what is interesting? It took a lifetime for him to do that. It took a lifetime for him to shift his positions. And, and, I, and I'm convinced that the way I am today is not who I want to be for the rest of my life because I know God has so much more for me. And who you are today is not your final stage of life because as we begin to pursue God, our position can change. We, as we begin to find maturity in him, our position can change. And, and we grow in him. And I'm sure many of you who have been a Christian for a while have seen vast changes in your life. What things that you were hung up with when you first became a Christian, you've started to find maturity and victory over those things. Your position is changing. Jesus talked about this position change in Luke chapter 9. He says this, then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, the thrill sequence, right? The I, me, my, that Solomon was talking about. You got you to turn from that and take up your cross daily and follow me. You, you got to go a different direction. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Now, quite literally in Jesus' day, or immediately after Jesus' day in the early church, it could mean laying your life down physically. Now, in the United States today, that's, that's very rarely going to be reality for us. So what is Jesus talking about? How can we apply this to our lives today? Well, there are two masters in our life, us and God. And we can choose who we want to give our life to. The thrill sequence says, I, me, my. I denied myself nothing. I want to do this. I want to do that. But the other side of that is Jesus saying, hey, you give your life to me, and you'll really save it. You, you invest your life in yourself. It's, you're not going to go far. You're not going to go anywhere. But you begin to invest your life in me. You're going to begin to discover, discover something real, something with purpose and something with power. And as you do that, your maturity is going to grow. And you're going to begin to change the world around. And you're going to find more satisfaction in life than you ever thought possible. And today, I think every single one of us need to make a decision. Who is going to lead our life? You or God? And Jesus calls us to be led by him. So here's what I'd like to do this morning. I'd like to be able to pray with you. And we're just going to pray the, the simplest of all prayers. God, God, lead my life. Lead my life. So if you don't mind, maybe closing your eyes, bowing your heads. 
No one moving around, no noise, just so there's no distraction. I'd like you just to say quietly to yourself the prayer I'm about to pray with you. And if you're in here today and you've never prayed this prayer, this prayer is what has become known as the salvation prayer, where I'm surrendering my life to you, God, instead of leading it myself. And when we do that, he forgives us of all the things in our past, all the sins, all the shame, because sometimes we feel like we're not good enough to actually do something for God, actually to be used by God or to find a purpose with him. But that's what Jesus did for us. He took away all of that sin and shame of our past and the guilt over it when he died on the cross to bring forgiveness to us. So when we say, Jesus, I want you at the center of my life, I want you to lead my life, he can, he can help you erase that past at the same time. So let's pray this prayer quietly, right where you are. Jesus, this morning I pray that you would forgive me of everything in my life that does not belong there. And I pray that you would lead me today. Lead me into a greater relationship with you. I give you my entire life. I don't want to lead. I want you to lead. I surrender my life to you. And as I surrender my life to you, I pray that you would bring into me purpose and power and changing of position so I could really, really understand and know you in an incredible way. In your name we pray. Amen.